good morning. Um, welcome for our uh, first liquefaction webinar. Um, today's webinar is to look at new residential building consent requirements, which came into effect at the end of November. And these are to ensure that buildings can withstand liquefaction effects. To aid these new requirements, we've commissioned a region-wide liquefaction map. As a council, we're improving our knowledge base about local hazards and sharing that information with local communities, stakeholders such as yourselves. Uh, today's uh, presenters uh, for the uh, webinar will be uh, first up Ian McCauley. Uh, Ian's our building assurance manager. Ian will give a, an introductory overview about how we want to ensure the new buildings can withstand the effects of liquefaction. Ian has 30 years experience in the construction sector, a further 10 working for building authorities. And Ian joined us here at TDC in 2019. The next up on the, on the list of presenters today is Glenn Stevens. Glenn is a senior natural hazard scientist. Glenn will give a, an overview of the new regional liquefaction mapping. Glenn has more than 20 years work in the resource management uh, for local government in New Zealand, and much of it's been here in Tasman. His work involves providing natural hazard advice and expertise across a wide range of council functions across the district. And third up is Bevan Barker. Bevan's our building assurance technical lead, and Bevan will discuss the building consent process and what it means for a proposal. It's, uh, <laughs> sorry, I lost my track. Bevan has 30 years uh, work in, in the zone requiring uh, refraction assessment. Um, he's got a 30 year experience, sorry, in the building sector, and it spans from residential property development to building consent processes and inspections. Bevan's worked in the building team here at TDC for the past eight years. I'm Darren Palmer. I'll be hosting it today. Uh, I'll be looking after the housekeeping, which if you're keen, we, we are keen to make this presentation as interactive as possible. So feel free to ask any questions, put them into the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. We will be um, accumulating those and we'll put them together at the end, answer any questions you have at the end of our presentation. So without further ado, I'll uh, like to hand over to Ian McCauley, our Building Insurance Manager. Ian, it's all yours. Take it away. Sorry, just a few. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to get straight into it and um, give you a little bit of a higher overview of uh, what's going on with this, uh, um, this legislation change. Well, it's not actually a legislation change. It's uh, at the acceptable solutions level, which is not the building code change. So um, if Darren can please put on the next slide. So I'm just going to comment uh, first around that, uh, have a bit of commentary around that first um, uh, bullet point there and the commentary I'll make will deal with those other three bullet points uh, in general as you'll see. Um, many of you will already understand the structure of the building code and the means of compliance and how that fits, um, but it's uh, kind of an ongoing uh, discussion and training within within council as well at, uh, for new building control officers. So, as many of you will know, acceptable solutions are deemed to comply pathways uh, that by law must be accepted as demonstrating comp compliance with the New Zealand Building Code. And some refer to acceptable solutions as cookie cutters, which is a pretty good uh, description. Section 24 of the Building Act contains provisions for the Chief Executive of MB to either amend or revoke any acceptable solutions at any time, including verification methods, actually. Our lawmakers uh, considered that it was necessary in case any product or method was later found non-compliant with the building code. I think we can all remember uh, that such a situation uh, happened uh, with many direct fix plaster systems that were used in the 80s and 90s. And many of these systems were actually approved as acceptable solutions and were later found were later found not to comply with the building code and were revoked or amended as a result. And that was uh, during the leaky building crisis. They were thought to comply with the New Zealand building code, but in fact did not. And the practical consequences of this, as we know, were that many houses were constructed with building consents and code compliance certificates issued, which were in fact later found not to comply with the building code. So it's safe to say we're all familiar with the statement, all building work must comply with the New Zealand Building Code. 
So the chief executive really didn't have any choice but to revoke those uh, uh, that, that, um, those methods of uh, compliance. And the Canterbury earthquakes going on to B1. The Canterbury earthquakes destroyed and damaged, as we know, many foundations that were constructed using the acceptable solution of B1. And as a result of this, Canterbury by default didn't use the acceptable solution anymore in the, in the rebuilding, surprise, surprise, but developed foundations using special engineering design on ground where liquefaction was either possible or likely in the subsequent earthquake, in any subsequent earthquakes, they had to design, redesign those and not use the acceptable solution, even though it was a deemed to comply pathway. However, across the rest of the country, the acceptable solutions, a solution for B1 continued to be used. And meanwhile, enormous amounts of money were poured into engineering collaborations. And I'm sure engineers that are in this webinar will, will be well aware of this. Uh, international um, collaborations as well, workshops and studies were um, resulted uh, from the earthquakes and these are continuing. The New Zealand Building Code B1 objective, functional requirement and performance actually requires the effects of earthquakes to be taken into account and any cursory reading of the B1 Building Code will make that very, very clear in all of those, um, those sections of that uh, Building Code uh, and, the, and the objective, the functional requirement and the performance requirements. Um, the Building Code B1 actually uses the terms throughout, including rupturing, becoming unstable, losing equilibrium, deformation, vibratory response, and yes, even specifically, quote, account shall be taken of all physical conditions likely to affect the stability of buildings, and it goes on to add in the, uh, in the um, list there, earthquake. And again, another quote from B1, it sh uh, sh building shall take into account the effects of changes in groundwater level and ground loss and slumping. So what becomes clear when you read all of these things is that B1 required and always did require that foundations had to take into account the effects of an earthquake. So it's no surprise uh, to, to us that MB eventually remove the ability for the acceptable solution of B1, which assumes good ground, to be used on any ground where liquefaction is possible for the simple reason that if the foundations have not been designed to withstand the effects of liquefaction, they would not necessarily comply with B1 of the building code. Therefore, any building consent application, which nominates the acceptable solution as a compliance pathway for B1 foundation design, from the 29th of November last month must now include supporting evidence to show that liquefaction is either not likely or is a low probability. And as is usual, nothing's changed in this, in, in it being the responsibility of applicants to include this information within the building consent application. The liquefaction mapping we have done can help stakeholders with this. So a little bit on to this next slide, talking about responsibilities. Again, I'm probably telling people, uh, uh, webinar attendees, what they already know, but it's always good to remind ourselves. And I think it's fair to say that one of the most common problems within the industry and a constantly repeating problem is when respective roles and responsibilities get confused and we stray into each other's lanes. We have the problem in the BCAs just as much as uh, any other of the stakeholders. But Parliament recognised that it was critical to clearly define the specific ro roles and responsibilities of the stakeholders involved. Straying into other lanes has been part of many legal claims in the courts. Who was responsible for what? I wasn't responsible for that. It was a designer, the B a BCA, uh, straight into my lane, therefore he's responsible or that entity is responsible for that. So the designer under the building code, uh, oh, sorry, the building act rather, section 14, the designer is responsible to include sufficient evidence in the consent application to substantiate compliance. 
and it's the responsibility of the Building Consent Authority to verify or check those requirements. And these words are clearly defined within the Building Act. Checking belongs to the BCA, preparing belongs to the designers. Existing geotechnical reports will usually and often contain adequate evidence already in, included an assessment, including the assessment or consideration of liquefaction. So it's up to the applicant to obtain this information and include it with supporting documentation of the building consent application. And again, this is what the, uh, the liquef liquefaction mapping that TDC has done can assist. It'll often be uh, likely that the geotechnical assessments made on the entire subdivision had considered liquefaction on each lot already. And this is happening, I'm told, um, and it has been happening for some time because uh, geotechnical engineers are up to speed with what's going on. If this is the case, it, it'll simply be a matter of designers, including the same geotechnical report within the supporting documentation for every building consent application made on that subdivision. You might have 15 lots and you might be submitting an application on lot two or three or four. Well, as we all know with geotechnical reports, um, uh, good geotechnical reports uh, have uh, ground conditions um, uh, reporting on the various lots for the very reason that uh, to, in preparation for building consent applications and sub uh, foundation design um, to be made correctly. Um, so um, this webinar is, is intended to familiarise stakeholders with the liquefaction mapping that TDC has done in support of our building community and also to present and discuss the guidance and assistance that MBIE have put together to assist everyone and uh, to do it uh, smoothly as possible. And I'll now hand over to TDC's natural hazard scientist, Glenn Stevens, to explain the regional liquefaction mapping that we have completed. Thank you. So thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a very brief outline of liquefaction and then introduce the regional mapping that we've undertaken. Um, I'd like to think many of you are quite familiar with liquefaction. Um, we've all sort of saw what happened in the Christchurch earthquake sequence. Um, but essentially, it's just where loose, unconsolidated, sandy or silty soils um, liquefy when they're subject to ground shaking. Um, so it's, it's only the, the sandy and the fine grain sandy and silty soils that tend to liquefy. Clays and gravels tend not to liquefy so much. Another key ingredient is they need to be saturated, so high water tables um, and then subject to the shaking. And on the next slide, we've got a, a straight from the MFE, uh, sorry, the MB um, guidance. And so it's just, a, a, I guess, a cartoon showing some of the effects of liquefaction. Um, the liquefied material could eject up to the surface, sand boils, sand volcanoes, um, but that ejector then leaves a void and you can get subsidence. You get um, buoyant objects such as tanks and pipes can rise up and float. Um, but I guess what's relevant to us here is, is, is what happens to buildings and their foundations and in a sense the ground just is unable to support those foundations. Um, where uh, you have a river bank or some unrestrained sort of edge, um, you can get lateral spreading, tension cracks and other movement. Again, they have um, implications for building foundations. So that diagrams from the MB guidance, uh, on the image on the right there, you can see a, a picture of that guidance. So that's got a very good summary of the effects of liquefaction and the processes. And so if you want more information, I'll urge you to have a look uh, at that. And so as Ian talked about where liquefaction is possible or where liquefaction is low or unlikely has implications in terms of the, the building consent processes. And so to that end, we've undertaken uh, or engaged Becker to undertake some regional liquefaction susceptibility mapping for us. So this follows the MB guidance. It's a level A mapping. It's, it's defined, the level A is defined in that guidance. And so the, the level A is just a, a, a qualitative desktop study which considers regional data sets. And the, these sort of data sets is the, the geological maps um, and just other information that can be over a wide area. A key thing here with the level A mapping is it doesn't include a site specific geotechnical investigations. The level B and the C and D mapping are those steps. And so we've not done that yet, but that's something that we've, we may um, do in the future. 
So looking at the map outputs now, um, and so this is a screen grab, um, grab on the right, uh, left there of, of a web viewer that we've um, got on our website. So that's taken the mapping that the Becker have done for us and we've just packaged it into this viewer. And so this information is available. Clearly it's, it's important for the building consent process, but it also gets used for a range of other council processes, including RMA planning and strategies. So this is the, the Tasman environment plan, which is up for review at the moment. Um, but it's also fed into resource consent processes and subdivision consents is the obvious one there with the building site certification processes. Uh, other council functions include asset management, so it's all the pipes and roading and assets, uh, civil defence emergency management, and it's also used to inform limbs and pins. So looking at the map out, outputs um, here, so on the right there we've got a, a, an image from the mapping of the Richmond Waimea Mapua area. So I'll just run through, I guess, the three categories that have been mapped, and I'll start with the, the blue at the bottom there. And so these are just areas of very low liquefaction vulnerability. So these are sort of the, the hill slopes, the bedrock hill slopes, and other sort of areas that where it's from the geological evidence, we're confident it's not going to liquefy. The next area that's sort of the green area. And so these are areas where whilst they're unconsolidated sediments, for various reasons, such as the water table, the age of the sediments, the composition, these are considered where liquefaction damage is unlikely. And so the tan color or the gold color or the yellow color, um, this is the area that's been mapped where liquefaction is possible. And so the key thing is it's, we're not saying that the entire area that's mapped in the, in the yellow there will liquefy. It's just within these areas is where we would expect to see liquefaction. And so, like we said before, it's these areas of fine grain saturated material. And so that could be a, a, an buried river channel and filled with silt, could be an old pond or swamp area, or estuary margin. And so uh, this regional scale, these haven't been delineated and we've just got these areas. So if we look to the next slide, there's some examples here of Motueka and Eastern Golden Bay. And I guess this, you should notice that the areas where liquefaction is possible includes the entire urban sort of footprint of Motueka, Antarctica. And so as many of you realize that, you know, there's quite a lot of gravels in these areas and not all of these areas liquefy. And so all we're saying is that liquefaction is possible and hence it trips you into these processes under the Building Act, which my uh, colleague Bevan will now talk about. Right, thanks, Glenn. Okay, so what, what, what we're going to do here is just having a quick overview of um, MB's recommendations for um, a compliance pathway. So they, can, they are recommending that the foundation options outlined in the Canterbury guidance um, regarding the three technical, three technical categories are used. Um, a lot of the technical categories are explained quite, quite well on the um, website and the links are provided here. So what we're dealing with is, as you know, we're dealing with a very low, medium and high liquefaction vulnerabilities. Can, next slide. Um, you're probably familiar with this table also. Um, it sends down the flow path of establishing what um, foundation can be selected for the, for the, for the, in relation to the regional mapping. Um, it, the band through the middle there with the um, multicolored boxes with very low, low, medium, high, unlikely, impossible and undetermined. Um, as you can see with the colors on, on the uh, regional mapping, we are looking at very low, which was basically, we can go straight to the TC1 and we're looking at the unlikely and the possible being tan. Now, can we go to the next slide? Now, again, here we go, we got the tan, the, the green, and the blue representative of the vulnerability and the likelihood and possible. Um, just keep those in mind. So what we've got is for a low, for a very low site, um, we're looking at using TC1 NZS 3604, um, again associated with the blue area on the on the regional mapping. Um, next slide. Okay, so here we go. This is for the unlike for the unlikely area where liquefaction damage is unlikely. Again, we're looking at TC1 NZS 3604 foundation as B1AS1 compliance. So basically for the very low and the unlikely areas, it's pretty much business as usual. Um, and now we're moving on to the possible. So this is where we're starting to look at uh, liquefaction assessment for the site. Now, of course, it's dependent on the seismicity risk. 
So if you're if you got a if you're not at a high seismicity risk, you're looking at a, a TC2 foundation. Um, if you're above that, you're going to the left, and we're looking at ECD. Um, of course, this, the TC1, TC2 foundations may be possible and may be likely to be in, used in the possible zone, but that will come through engineering assessment. Um, next slide, please. So the category guidance is actually broken into um, multiple um, dwelling foundation types. So what we've got A, B, C, and within the B and C, you've got subcategories. But basically, it comes down to the to the to the um, weight of the building. So the light of the building, the less the less issues. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so these, this is the slide, the, the, the flow chart out of the guidance in, in order to select the buildings for, for you know, the, the correct foundation type. So for TC1 so selection, it relates to everything with an ultimate bearing capacity above 300 kPa. And again, it's selective on the types of buildings. Now this is in the areas TC1 um, for, uh, or should we say it was very low, and unlikely. So construction is in accordance with um, NZS 3604. Again, with the TC1 foundations, it's just business as usual. If we turn up and we find that um, there's a soft ground or anything, or bearing issues, fill or whatever, um, we just refer that to the um, engineer for assessment. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the TC2. Um, this is the one that would come through into the possible zone. Again, engineering assessment, is, will be required on the site, um, on these sites. And again, it is a selection based on the type of building for the foundations. But again, engineering sign off is required. Uh, next slide, please. Here we go, we've got um, some, some links there. Those links will provide you with access to all the relevant um, sites, um, which will provide you with the actual information you need. Now, while we've talked about re largely residential foundations. Um, th there could be a question out there in regards to garage foundations um, and TC around um, TC2, TC1 and TC3. Well, the TC3 sites um, that were specified in the Green Zone in Canterbury um, were addressed in, in, on the MB website with regard to garage foundations. Um, and it, it even discussed uh, TC2 areas. Um, just an excerpt was that the freestanding garage, if your garage is freestanding and uninhabited, you do not need to have the foundation specifically constructed to counter the effects of liquefaction. So you don't need to apply the um, flow charts from residential to a freestanding garage. Um, I think that's pretty much it. We'll go to questions. Yeah, my, my camera won't work. <laughs> Okay, that was interesting. My camera failed to uh, react to me. So yes, there's, there's plenty of information available should you need it. Come to our website, uh, tasman.govt nz liquefaction. MB have got a lot of uh, information available, as you can see on the screen here for um, uh, backgrounders, the MB website for Z values and the garage foundations. Now, uh, if you have any questions, please stick them in the Q&A uh, box in, in the bottom of the screen. Um, because we're more than happy to to answer anything that you uh, any queries that have popped up. Otherwise, you can contact the building support. Had a couple here uh, that have come through. Just first up, guys, team, if um, if you can get your uh, panelists can get your cameras going. Uh, there's a question here: How to deal with the sites that straddle two areas shown on the map? Like, you know, if, if one's on a, a likely and one's an unlikely. Uh, how, how are we going to deal with that? Who, who would like to pick that up? Is, is, uh, is that Glenn? Um, that's or probably Ian? more related to a building uh, que question, I think, that uh, um, it's typical with, uh, I think Bevan can pick this up and, and drill down a bit deeper if he, if he feels it need, needed to be, but um, it would be very unlikely that we would go to the lesser. Um, typical with um, the rules and the code and everything, you always go to the more onerous of the requirements, um, it would be um, pretty pretty um, poor uh, um, decision making. I think if you if you if you were um, did half and half half um, half foundations that uh, with three six or four and half ECD, I don't think that would be economical as well. So my view would be that uh, wouldn't be uh, likely that that would be uh, that would be an, a solution. But uh, Bevan, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, I, I will. I will. Um, the line on the mapping isn't a this is a this is the stop start line. 
Um, so the ground won't just go from okay to bad mm. on those given lines. It'll, it'll, it'll happen in other areas. I mean, most likely cases, what is pertinent is what, what could be deemed to be um, a very low would be consistent through that boundary. But in the other, in, on the other side of the coin, it might uh, TC, the other side of the coin, it might be consistent from the higher risk to the lower risk. But ultimately, it's going to come down to the engineering assessment um, to define what what actually fa what foundations are used for those zones and how it will affect that building. Stuff so, okay. Another question here: Are IL one pole sheds and non-structural shed slabs required to have the liquefaction assessment applied to them? Well, the IL pole, the IL one pole sheds. Well, I mean, that's very that's very similar to what was discussed with regards to garage foundations during the during the presentation. So you, you're looking at IL one pole shed. The pole sheds are usually SCD'd anyway. Um, so TC1, TC2 would apply. Um, so having an assessment done on a pole shed, I wouldn't see that it would have to have a liquefaction assessment. Okay, good, cool. Thank you. Um, query also, can, can you jump to a TC2 or 3 foundation without getting a geotech report? Can you, can you yeah, well, is that an optional uh, available, an option available? You can do that, but you will need a geotechnical report because those TC1, TC2 would be applicable in the possible zone. So you've got your geotechnical assessment that you'll be needing for those foundations. Right. There's, there's one final one here. Are GIS shapefiles available? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, is that, there might be a, who would that? Oh, Glenn? I'll, That's I'll Glenn, yeah. That. Um, Hopefully they are. The intention is that they will be downloadable, or a um, web server will be able to you be able to directly link to that. And so, if it's not there already, it will be there shortly. Okay, that's um, that's all the questions we seem to have. Any more? We can give it a couple more minutes for uh, for questions if anyone has them. Just a reminder: this is being this PowerPoint is being recorded, and. Uh, so you can pick up the recording of the webinar and the actual PowerPoint as it was presented. It'll be on our website probably from tomorrow when it comes up. Um, there's there's another question that's come up in the chat box, and and that is uh, I actually can't see. So is a is it a Firth? Um, I've got a there we go. Is a Firth rib raft? Uh, uh, specified to TC2 levels deemed an acceptable solution on non-liquefiable land or does it require engineering input? So yeah, that's the first rib raft, uh, raft specified to TC2. Is that yours, Bevan? I'll probably comment on that oh, yeah. just first. I, th I, think, I think in the first instance, I'd definitely refer to the uh, technical specifications of rib raft. Um, I've been a while since I've read them, but I think you'll find that that uh, unless um, unless the technical specifications do uh, take that uh, into account, if the technical specifications have been updated to include liquefaction for a TC uh, TC2, I would uh, I would assume that that would be um, you know because it's, it is an engineered technical um, product, so um, I would think that would be suitable. But I'll be looking for the at the uh, further draft specifications for that. Uh, Bevan, you want to add to that? No, I would suggest that um, because you, you've got the TC1, TC2, and I mean, for example, Ribraft have got a TC3 um, slab now, is now enhanced slabs. So it, it's relevant to the, the specifications. All right. Okay, well, that wraps up our webinar for today. Thank you very much. Um, as, as I said, the recording of the webinar and the PowerPoint presentation will be available on our Tasman District Council website. Thank you, panellists. Um, I'm sure this won't be the last time we do this. And thank you, attendees. We appreciate uh, you coming along to our meeting today. And uh, yeah, as, as I said, any questions, do get in touch with us, building.support at tasman.govt.nz. Thank you very much and uh, see you later.